Today I'll be talking about fully homomorphic encryption and in particular two aspects um, relating uh, kind of to practical importance which are security and encoding. And this is based on um, two joint works with many co-authors who are named on the slide um, and I'll point out exactly what these papers are and where you can find them at the end of the talk. So before we um, get started with the security and encoding, let's just introduce homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption is this kind of magical technology where you can operate on ciphertext in such a way as to operate meaningfully on the underlying plaintext, and you don't need to decrypt them in order to do this, or otherwise give access to the secret key. So it's typically explained in this client-server model, which we have here. Um, so we've got a purple client and a blue cloud server. And the client is the owner of some data X. Um, and they'd like to compute a function f on the data x. However, perhaps they're not very computationally powerful, so they want to outsource this computation to the cloud. But at the same time, they might not trust the cloud. Um, so instead of sending the data x, they send encryption of x. So in this slide, and I think throughout the talk, anytime you see a yellow box is an encryption of the item within the box. So the client sends um, the encryption of x and f over to the server, and the server runs this homomorphic evaluation function which is taking as input the ciphertext encrypting x and the function f, and its output is an encryption of f of x. And it doesn't need access to the secret key or to otherwise decrypt in order to produce this. And note that it doesn't learn f of x, it only learns an encryption of f of x. So the server generates this output ciphertext, sends it back over to the client, and the client, who's the one who owns the secret key, can decrypt and recover f of x, which is what they wanted. So in order to achieve this, um, we basically need a ring structure in the ciphertext space. So in particular, we need a homomorphic addition operation, um, which is taking a, as input a ciphertext encrypting x, a ciphertext encrypting y, and its output is a ciphertext encrypting x plus y, where that's the plus operation in the plaintext space. And then similarly, we also need a homomorphic multiplication operation, uh, which is taking as input an encryption of x and an encryption of y, and the output is an encryption of x times y in the plaintext space. So perhaps you can already think of some potential applications for homomorphic encryption, but there's really many that have been considered. Here is a non-exhaustive list of different application areas where we've seen uh, literature like looking at how to apply homomorphic encryption in these settings. And kind of a general theme, I guess, is um, trying to obtain insights from data which you otherwise couldn't access due to privacy or legal concerns. So stuff like aggregation or machine learning or statistical analysis on data sets. For example, medical data sets, if you're not the patient or the doctor, then you won't be able to um, use these data sets, but there could be interesting insights to learn, like um, correlations between illnesses or effectiveness of drugs or something like this. So yeah, you can really think of many, many applications, and indeed people are working on this. But of course, if we're going to um, be talking about matters of practical interest, homomorphic encryption, we've, we also need to ask, is homomorphic encryption even a practical thing? Um, so the first fully homomorphic encryption scheme um, from Gentry in 2009 and, and other schemes that followed shortly after were, were very impractical. You definitely wouldn't implement them, but they were a really good theoretical ad advance, of course. Um, but more recently, we've started to see a number of schemes which you can implement and indeed, now implementation has moved to the point of having um, software libraries available. So research libraries, um, this is also a non-exhaustive list of some of the ones that are currently available. So you really, if you do have an application in mind, you can take this and certainly research on whether it's um, feasible. And together with this, uh, these developments, um, uh, a consortium of industry, academia, and government is looking to standardize this technology. So I think we can infer from this that perhaps within five to 10 years, we'll see a lot more commercialization of homomorphic encryption technology once standards are in place. So yeah, right now it's moving towards practicality, I would say. We have some results in, in, in certain application settings, but it's really more on the research side right now. Okay, so now I want to move on to the first um, interesting uh, practical use thing we need to consider, which is security. So essentially, all or at least most of the um, homomorphic 
encryption schemes which are currently being used um, have their security, which is ultimately based on this learning with errors problem, which I'll now describe. So suppose I have this secret vector S, and there's a public matrix A. And I form a vector B, uh, components of this vector, by taking a row of A, multiplying by S, and then adding a small error term. So if I form a B in this way, and I give you A and B, the search learning with errors problem is for you to try to recover S. And you can also pose a decision learning with errors problem, which is if I just give you A and B, um, can you tell whether they're both uniformly random or whether I really formed them in this kind of form of B equals A times S plus D? Um, so from the point of view security parameters which we need to consider, which kind of characterize an LWE instance are the following. So the parameter N is the dimension of the secret vector. And somehow you can think of this um, as like a security parameter. And Q is a modulus, so all of these um, vectors and matrices have, en have entries in ZQ and all of the operations are modulo Q. <coughs> so this parameter alpha characterizes the error distribution. Typically the error distribution is um, a discrete Gaussian and alpha relates to the standard deviation sigma divided by Q. And then M is the number of samples. So what I described before of taking one row of A times by S and adding E is like one sample. So M is the number of rows of A or the number of samples. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, is B encrypted? So at this stage, it's not an encryption. It's just, a, I, I guess, a probability distribution. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, this is um, because it's, this is a vector, so it's not a box, but I can see why that's confusing. That's what you get when you slice slides together. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Yeah, this is, um, this, the colors here are supposed to distinguish that, um, a and B would be public, and S and E would be, like, I would know them, but you wouldn't. So private. That's a good question, and yeah, I would definitely fix these slides in the future to change the color. <laughs> okay, so learning with errors falls into this area called lattice-based crypto, but so far from this kind of matrix and vector situation, you might not immediately see how this on Earth relates to lattices. So let me try to link the two via the bounded distance decoding problem. So firstly, I'll define a lattice, which is a discrete subgroup of, um, in this case, RK. Um, and we normally interact with a lattice by means of a basis. So we take a basis as a set of uh, linearly independent vectors in RK. And then the lattice generated by this basis is the set of integer combinations of the basis vectors. So here on the slide, I've drawn a two-dimensional lattice, and the blue vectors are, are one basis of this lattice. Um, of course, there are many more, infinitely many, in, and greater than two. And the bounded distance decoding problem is uh, given a, a lattice specified by a basis and a target vector t, um, which is somewhere in the space, and the knowledge that t is somehow close to a lattice vector. Can you find the closest lattice or a closest lattice vector to the target vector t? So here, um, the target vector t is the orange one, and you want to recover the red um, point in the lattice. So if you've heard of closest vector problem, it's, it's very similar to that, except you've got this additional guarantee that you are close to the lattice. So now how to see that learning with errors basically is a bounded distance decoding problem. Um, so consider the lattice generated by the columns of A. You can write down a basis of this that is from the matrix A. Then S, even though you don't know it, is giving you an integer combination of, of this basis. So somehow you know there is a point W equal to A times S in the lattice, even though you don't know S at this point. And then if you think about A times S plus E, you're adding a small error. It's perhaps a Gaussian, so it's not very far away from a few multiples of its standard deviations. It's, it, so you know that you have perturbed this lattice point, but you're still close to it. So if you can construct this basis from the lattice A, and then you have the target vector is A times S plus E, then if you can solve bounded distance decoding, you can get back to this point W equals A times S. And once you're there, you're done because you can just do linear algebra to recover S and solve search LWE from that. So in fact, the homomorphic encryption schemes I'm gonna talk about later are based on a related problem called the ring learning with errors problem. So this is the same kind of picture, and again, this is even more confusing. I'm sorry about the yellow boxes. <laughs> Let me declare in advance, but uh, <laughs> it's consistent from the LWE definition. Um, 
Okay, so this is typically taking place in a ring RQ, which is polynomials with uh, coefficients modulo ZQ, modded out by X to the N plus one, and N is a power of two. This is normally the ring we're working in. And then within this ring, um, I could have a, a secret ring element S. I generate a random uh, ring element A. I pick a ring element following an error distribution. I do A times S plus E, and I send you A and B. And then the search ring linear without problem would again be, given this A and B, can you recover the S that I um, used to generate it? Or you can have a decision problem where, again, I give you A and B, and you have to decide whether they're uniformly random or they're formed in this special way. And this is the one we're going to use for the security argument, basically, because if decision ring LWE is hard to solve, then basically a ring LWE sample looks pseudo-random. And that's nice because we want ciphertext to look pseudo-random. OK, so here's um, the FHE scheme. Well, the homomorphic encryption scheme, because it's not really FHE at this point. The, this is the FE scheme. And it will be a running example throughout the rest of the talk. And obviously, I don't expect you to like, take anything meaningful from just this like, slide of information. Um, but um, what I want to um, move to is show you how to take the scheme parameters and extract the relevant LWE parameters and then argue about security from them. But I also, while we're here, um, I just want to say like the ciphertext is this pair of um, elements in the ring. And then like to do the, the actual homomorphic operations, you're, it is exactly what I said before about um, having a ring structure on the ciphertext space because addition of ciphertext is going to be just component-wise polynomial addition. And multiplication looks more complicated, but you're still getting kind of like, it is just polynomial multiplication and then some scaling, which you need to take care of. So yeah, the relevant um, algorithms then to look at the security. So um, key generation is done as follows. So the, the secret key is a vector S, which is not in, in fact chosen from the whole of RQ typically, but from some smaller set called R2. Um, and then the public key really does look exactly like a ring LWE sample because it's um, yeah, a, a uniformly random element A, it's one part of the public key, and then the other part is the minus of A times S plus E, um, where S is the this, this secret key, and then E is chosen from an appropriate error distribution. So um, what this means is then if you have the public key, the problem of trying to recover the secret key from the public key is search ring learning with errors. And then on the encryption, uh, we have the following situation. So um, it's um, two components of the ciphertext. This one really is another ring LWE sample because you firstly take um, an element U from the uh, secret distribution, you times it by A from the public key, so this was a uniformly random element, and you add up um, E2 from the error distribution. So if decision ring learning with errors is hard, then this thing just looks pseudo-random on this side. And then on the other side, you've got this delta M term, which you can think of just now as the message term. Um, and then you again got this kind of term that looks like it might be ring LWE. In fact, you have to like, do two layers of it because it's this term B from the public key. So you're arguing here that the public key is um, pseudo-random because of like one application of ring LWE. So then you could as well treat this as if it was really a random element in the ring. And then that term that you would be adding would be another ring LWE sample. So then you're masking the message term with a ring LWE sample. So you're masking the message with something that looks pseudo-random. So the whole ciphertext is looking pseudo-random. So that's basically the security argument for in-CPA security of the FP scheme. So and kind of within this, we've got the actual underlying ring LWE problem parameterized by RQ is giving you N and Q. And then chi is giving you alpha. So you're having your ring LWE instance parameters. So how do we argue concrete security of ring LWE-based FHE? Sorry. Yeah. When you say LWE sample, you mean a simple ABE? Or, or? Um, I'm, I'm meaning, so yeah, like this is one sample of ring LWE, the public key, for example. And then an RWE instance is, instance is like the NQ and alpha. And then, and then m equals 1, really, if you want to count about the number of samples as well. Okay. But it translates to, to m equals n samples when you map it to LWE. 
I don't say that explicitly in the next slide, but that's basically what that's basically what's going to happen. So yeah, you from the scheme parameters, the system, you extract the underlying wing LWE instance NQ alpha. And then it turns out that algorithms for solving wing LWE are actually just algorithms for solving LWE, and we don't know any other algorithm that, that performs significantly better. So you may as well just treat it as an LWE instance. And then so you just need to assure yourself that the underlying LWE instance is hard to solve. And there's always only one, not a few of them. So the mapping is one to one. Yeah, so you, you, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, the question was, are they, is the mapping one to one? And, and it's yes. OK, so algorithms for solving linear with errors. There's actually many. This is a subject for a whole talk in itself. Um, so in a, a work in 2015 with myself, Olbrecht, and Scott, we characterized, um, we basically surveyed the literature of ring LWE algorithms and characterized them into three different strategies. So the strategies here are in purple. Um, and then uh, the algorithms within those strategies are in blue. And then we see that many of these algorithms rely on this process called lattice reduction, which we'll come back to. And then lattice reduction requires this solving shortest vector problem in a smaller dimension, which we call SVP Oracle. And we've kind of already seen this BDD approach, which I described with the bounded distance decoding. So that was just one approach to solving linear with errors. So alongside this paper, um, Martin produced this LWE estimator tool, um, which is a Sage tool. And um, you can use it to estimate concrete security of your LWE instances in the following way. So its inputs are the instance uh, parameters n, q, and alpha. And then for each of the algorithms, it gives you as an output an estimate for the running time of that algorithm, the memory it's going to require, and the number of LWE samples it would require. And then it kind of has other optional parameters you could give it. So if you're in the situation where you know you have a limited number of samples, you can specify that number, which is typically the case here, because we know we've got m equals n, or m equals 2n. Um, if you've got a specially small secret, which we do have, even though I didn't really say it so explicitly, and then um, if you want to specify what the lattice reduction cost model you want to use is, you can also do that. So mm -hmm. can we think of this as a portfolio of attacks? And then you, you, set your, you put your parameters in there, and they tell you how well these attacks are going to perform? Or? Uh, yeah, I, I can't claim that it's all possible attacks. It was. But like people might develop new algorithms that aren't necessarily included in the estimator because this was developed even though we keep updating it, it was originally written in, in twenty fifteen. So, okay, nice. but it, we tried to, we we make it clear on on the web page exactly what um, algorithms are solving LWE are included and 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 so you can see if if that's comprehensive enough. Um, yeah. And of course, we encourage you, if you do write a new algorithm, to please like, write an estimate for it <laughs> and submit it as a pull request. OK, so um, as I mentioned, there's this standardization effort um, for homomorphic encryption. And one of the things they want to standardize is the secure parameter selection. And in fact, they're using this LWE estimator tool um, to recommend what they consider secure parameters. So this is really neat for us. But for me, it's not the whole picture. And t to tell you the whole picture, we're going to move on to um, this joint work I've done with many co-authors. And it's to do with this ongoing NIST process. So NIST right now, you might know this, are looking to standardize um, post-quantum uh, crypto schemes, specifically post-quantum uh, public key encryption, uh, key encapsulation mechanisms, and digital signatures. Um, they're doing this because quantum computers might be occurring in 10, 15, 20 years, and they want to be prepared for that time if it does come with um, like schemes that they've already standardized and approved. So they put out in 2016 a call for proposals to the community to, um, to submit their proposals in these categories. And the deadline was last November. And so they had 69 submissions, which they considered complete and proper, and are like going forward for consideration for standardiza standardization. And of these, 23 are in um, the lattice space space based on the LWE problem and a related problem called the entry problem, which by popular request, I will include a slide about what that is. <laughs> um, OK, so yeah. W within this um, proposal, NIST was asking the submitters to 
suggest concrete parameters for their schemes and provide some kind of cryptanalysis to support their scheme. Um, so one thing we can do is look at all of these proposals in the lattice space space and see what their cryptanalysis looks like, and then we can have a, a general overview of the state of play. And this is going to be applicable also to the FAG setting, of course, because we're ultimately like considering concrete hardness of learning with errors. Can you say a few words about the other four training space submissions? What other ideas could they have? Yeah, so they're in different areas. So there's some multivariate crypto ones, code-based crypto, isogeny-based, hash-based signatures. So all, fam all families, I think, of post-quantum crypto that have been considered have at least one submission uh, trying to propose in that space. I would say latter space is competitive among these, but we'll see what NIST concludes eventually. It, this, this is going to be a process that takes several years. I think they, they outline on their website a kind of timeline for how they want it to progress. Does that answer the question? OK, so the entry problem. Voila. Um, it's also... It's also a situation where you're in this polynomial ring and yeah, you have um, some secret polynomial and you get given the, the public key some other polynomial and, you, and so the search entry problem would basically be recover the secret key from the public key. Um, so I spliced in this slide from another talk and didn't... So what do I want to say here? So... From the point of view of cryptanalysis, um, we can reduce solving the entry problem to solving this USVP problem, which is unique shortest vector problem um, in this specific lattice, which you can generate from, so H is like the public element, and then this is like the public key, essentially. And then this um, vector is a short vector in this lattice, and it's an especially short vector. So unique shortest vector problem is a situation where you want to solve shortest vector problem in a lattice that has this really nice structure, where it's got, really, it's got one really short direction, and then all the other like non-parallel directions are somewhat longer. So what we do in this work where we're looking at the security of all the LWE and entry-based schemes is we have to imagine the entry problem as an LWE problem, and then we're going to put it into the LWE estimator, essentially, is what's going to happen. Um, so yeah, it's described on the slide. So the, um, the short vector FG for entry, you can let F be the LWE secret, and G can be the LWE error. Then the ring somehow corresponds naturally. So the entry ring is different. Um, it's divided out by a, a different polynomial. Um, but it, it's a polynomial of degree n, so n will be the dimension. Um, and then you extract from g the, the standard deviation, which is going to give you the alpha parameter. And then the, the small secretness is also going to come from the g parameter. OK, so. Um, at least we saw this for LWE earlier in the talk. There's several approaches for solving LWE, and many of them require this process lattice reduction. So what is lattice reduction? Here again is another lattice. And I have put on uh, two bases, two possible bases of this lattice. There's a red one and a blue one. And the idea of lattice reduction is to take um, a bad basis and turn it into a better basis. Um, and so here, well, what is a bad basis? So here the red basis is bad because it's got quite long vectors and they're quite close together. Whereas we much prefer the blue basis because they're relatively shorter vectors and they're more orthogonal. And somehow when you see it in like two dimensions, it's completely intuitive. Like you can just easily imagine the whole of this lattice being like created from this blue basis, whereas you have to do some kind of, you basically do the lattice reduction algorithm in your head to construct the lattice from these two vectors in the, in the bad basis. Unfortunately, you can't do it in your head in larger dimensions. <laughs> Or fortunately, <laughs> from the point of view of <laughs> crypto. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, what there what there is, in, we can see. We'll see this in, in a few slides in the literature right now in light space literature, and it's reflected in the proposals, is that there's not consensus really on how to exactly estimate the cost of this lattice reduction process. 
And so more precisely what the issue is, is this SVP oracle subroutine where you need to solve a short expected problem in some smaller dimension, exactly how you should est like estimate the cost of that. So when I say cost model, I'm meaning um, what is the cost of solving SVP in dimension beta just once, and then how many times do we need to do this SVP oracle call during the whole lattice reduction algorithm? So um, then the natural questions is, okay, how, how would we even implement the SVP oracle? And um, the two most commonly considered ways are sieving and enumeration. So sieving is taking two to the O of beta time, but is also two to the O of beta memory. Whereas enumeration can be either two to the O of beta squared or two to the O of beta log beta and then polynomial memory. And of course, you can do quantum speedups using Grover's algorithm. Um, so these are kind of the options for what the SVP oracle is. And then the question of how many calls there are. Um, there's also different suggestions in the literature. So a popular one is core SVP, which means we just want to make one call. Like we'll just, we'll just estimate as if we're doing one call. Maybe that's um, an underestimation, but it, it's clean, I guess. Um, and then you also see um, people suggesting you should do beta calls, where beta is this dimension you're performing SVP in. And you also see um, 8D calls, where D is the dimension of the whole lattice. And then we need to obviously, because we want to care about concrete security, we need to transform um, these kind of asymptotic things into actual explicit expressions. Um, so for sieving, we turn to this paper by Becker et al. for the best heuristic sieving algorithm, which is costing 2 to the 0.92 beta plus some little o of beta. And then people either just ignore the little o of beta um, or they like interpret it as a constant and they work out what the constant should be from experiments. And then on the enumeration front, it's the same kind of thing. You just write down, if it's going to be 2 to the o of beta log beta, you just write a series of constants, c1 beta log beta, c2 beta, c3. And similarly for the uh, 2 to the o of beta squared case, and again, you can use experiments to determine what these constants could be. So in this paper with um, many co-authors, Olbrecht, Curtis, Dio, Davidson, Postlethwaite, Verdier, and Wunderer, we basically like took all of the proposals, so all of the parameter sets that were proposed in all of the lattice-based proposals, and then all of the cost models that had been used um, in one of these proposals, one or more of these proposals, and we estimated the security using the LWE estimator of all of these schemes according to all of the cost models, with the hope that this provides a data set where you could um, maybe do further useful analysis. So perhaps if you have a favorite cost model, you could just compare in view of that cost model and see which one is more secure or less secure. And so, um, yeah. To evaluate the N2 based ones, you first reduce them to LWE, right? Yeah, we write them down as like an LWE instance in the manner I had on the previous slide. And then this reduction should guarantee that the, the LWE instance that you get is the best possible in a sense, right? Because unless the mapping is too, I mean, I mean, it's, it is an assumption that we're introducing here. We're assuming that entry should be mapped to LWE in, in this way, but it, could be mapped it, seems, it seems to be the, like the, the natural one you would do. I don't know how to do it differently, but this is a question really for Thomas. <laughs> so maybe we can discuss it further offline, but... Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, one thing to say as well is like in terms of like estimating security, we're looking at only the primal and dual attacks for LWE, so we're not l looking at all of the attacks from that big overview uh, chart that I showed you before. And then for entry, we're just looking at the primal attack. The dual attack doesn't apply in the entry case. So here are all of the cost models that you see in the NIST proposals. And really, I guess the conclusion could be here. Like, from the homomorphic encryption standardization point of view, it, you might get the feeling that everything's solved, or we just use the LWE estimator, like, cool, that's fine. But I would say, like, we still have some work to do because we don't have this consensus on estimating latch reduction exactly. And so hopefully, w through processes like the NIST process, we will 
start to reach consensus as a community. Oh yeah, um, yeah, the first many are all the sieving and then the bottom few are enumeration. And you can sort of see from their structure how you get them from like the previous slides I described. So you see that, for example, um, 0.292 beta, that's coming from that heuristic sieving algorithm. And then the 0.265 is coming from a quantum variant of it. And then like whether or not you add constants is based on what you're doing with this little o of beta term. And then these like log betas or log 8ds are coming with whether you want to do one call or beta calls or 8d calls, et cetera. And yeah, for completeness, um, we have a web page where you can like see the full table of results. And you can also filter it in convenient ways, which we hope is a useful tool for interacting with it. So please do check that out if you're interested. OK, time for part two, uh, encoding. So earlier, I showed you this slide to describe homomorphic encryption. Um, but really, I like made an assumption here, which might not be the case at all. So the client wants to send their data X to the server. But in order to do so, they just encrypt it and send it over. But this is assuming that the data is already a nice form that is the natural plain text space for the scheme, so they can straight away go away and encrypt it without any trouble. But in fact, this is not necessarily the case at all. And we have something that looks more like this picture. Because the plain text space is typically a polynomial ring, whereas your raw data might be like an integer, rational number, a complex number, or something. So you need to have a valid encoding um, mechanism to transform items from your raw data space, in this picture it's integers, into the plain text space. And then on the other side, when you've done your homomorphic operations, you've got your output ciphertext, you decrypt it, you get your output plain text, you're the client, you now need to interpret your output plain text as a real item in the raw data space. So this is introducing another layer of kind of correctness trouble, because you could firstly have correctness if the decryption didn't work, but you can also have a correctness failure if the decoding doesn't work. So this is, again, another important thing you need to think about when using this in practice. Okay, so yeah, the typical plain text space um, is indeed this polynomial ring. Uh, it looks very similar to the ciphertext space, except now we've got um, integers in, uh, bleh, coefficients in <coughs> integers mod t. Uh, the polynomials have those coefficients, and then it's, again, modded out by x to the n plus 1. So t is this integer called the plain text modulus. Um, and yeah, so you're kind of taking care of the correctness problem is wrapped up in choosing an appropriate t. So while you're moving through the homomorphic evaluation operation, you're operating on ciphertext, what's going on in the underlying plain text is that coefficients are growing. And yeah, the problem is, if any of them wrapped around modulo t, as they might, because that's the space where they live, then um, this could in, this basically will not mean that decoding will fail at the end. So what you have to do is anticipate how big you think they're going to grow, and then choose t that's larger than this, so that decoding doesn't fail. Um, but this actually introduces other problems, like t being large can make the noise in a ciphertext large, which can cause uh, problems to do with the correctness of decryption. So just to like, fix a concrete idea of what I mean by encoding, we can think of um, a binary encoding. And you simply write down, for example, your integer in binary. And then whatever the string is corresponds to the coefficients of the polynomial. So this, this one is going to be the 1, and then 1x plus 1x squared. And then decoding um, such a polynomial, you just evaluate it too. And then it's natural to generalize this to different bases, uh, capital B. So to encode, you would take um, a, a balanced representation of this. The balance means that the coefficients will be smaller, so that's handy. Um, and then decoding would be evaluating x equals b. So Hofstein and Silverman, already in 2001, proposed a different idea, which essentially corresponds to, what if we don't have an integer t, but instead we have a polynomial t? Uh, which is x minus b, where b is some positive integer. You could think of it as 2. So then this means the plain text space basically becomes isomorphic to this very convenient uh, z mod b to the n plus 1 z. And n in homomorphic encryption schemes, I don't think I've said this yet, is like really large. It's typically something like 2 to the 12, 2 to the 15. So 2 to the 2 to the 15 plus 1 is this really huge space. 
So this means it's very natural for encoding integers, and you've got a lot of time before you're going to get some kind of wraparound problem. Very nice. So naturally, people already started to think about this in the homomorphic encryption context. Um, and so there were two papers at Latin Crypt 2014. So Geza and Kabarkas um, looked at this in the context of a scheme called the BV scheme. But one drawback of their work was they didn't give an explicit construction. They just mentioned it as an encoding possibility. And then uh, Lauter, Lopez out and Nairig looked at it from the point of view of the Yashi scheme. Um, but unfortunately, one drawback was they didn't provide a performance analysis. And, and I should say as well, this work was based on an unpublished work of Lopez out and Nairig. So then what we did with Chen, Liner, and Zia um, is again took this unpublished work of uh, Lopez out and Nairig and looked at applying this Hofstein and Silverman idea in the context of the SV scheme. And in addition to that, we also um, analyzed how the noise growth would behave. I'll just, I think I'll define noise a bit later um, using some new, more intuitive de definition of noise. Um, we saw how it was a nice scheme for integers, but also we showed how to make rationals work for this scheme. Um, we then gave a performance comparison to FE. And lastly, we looked at how um, using the new scheme, which we call HPFV, high precision FV, uh, how this would impact on practical use cases. So uh, just to look at um, briefly how to apply it to the FV scheme, I just have um, some algorithms from the FV scheme and the corresponding algorithm in HPFV. Um, and yeah, maybe running a little bit short on time. Um, so what to say? Basically, it's completely analogous. Um, so for example, um, key generation is completely the same. You do have, um, in a way, you can think of it as like an encoding into the HPFV scheme. So in, in real FV, you have to like pick some kind of specific encoding mechanism. Here, one's kind of fixed by the encryption algorithm. And then um, when it comes to encryption, it's, it's just an analog because um, before you scale it by this factor Q over T, now we scale it by something that's basically Q over X minus B. And then the rest of the form is looking the same. So in particular, this means the security argument is completely the same. And then decryption, um, for FV, you have to times by T over Q to undo the fact you multiply by Q over T. And then here, you have to times by X minus B over Q to undo the fact you times by Q over X minus B. So it's, yeah, it's completely analogous. And I don't have addition and multiplication on here, but they're also the same. And so now I would just want to talk about the performance comparison with FV. Um, so, so the first thing we need to do is, of course, pick some kind of evaluation operation that we're going to do in order to compare the two schemes. So following some previous work of Gustav et al., uh, we thought about the evaluation of a regular circuit. And this is parameterized by A, D, and L. Um, so what, what's going on in the circuit is we do A additions and one multiplication. And we iterate this D times. That describes a circuit. And then the inputs are kind of characterized by L because they're integers in the interval minus L to L. OK, and then we need to fix some other things. So. Um, Security is the same, so we can just fix some NQ and alpha for both schemes. That's fine. Then we need to think about what encoder we're going to use in FV. So Chon et al. have shown that the NAF encoder is outperforming the balance space B encoder. So this is the one we chose for FV to give it like a f the best chance. Although I should say like now there are other um, kind of variants of the NAF encoder. So it'd be interesting to see how it would perform against something like W nib NAF or something. Um, so yeah, to just describe what NAF encoding is, it's non-adjacent form encoding. So this is kind of like a binary encoding, but you're also allowed minus one. And what you're not allowed is um, two non-zero entries next to each other. So before, we had seven going to basically one, one, one. And now, seven goes to eight minus one, because you can't have all these ones next to each other. So it ends up being x cubed minus one. And this is, I think this works because it behaves nicely when you do the multiplications. You get fewer cross terms building so quickly. OK, so we're going to evaluate this regular circuit. And what we're going to want to do is see what's the maximal depth d we can achieve. And why would it ever even be limited? It's due to this thing called noise, which I mentioned a bit before but didn't explain so far. 
So all ciphertext in homomorphic encryption schemes have this inherent property called noise. They're born with it. They need it for security. And then as you move through homomorphic operations, it grows. So it starts off relatively small, but as you um, do operations and especially multiplications, the noise grows. And eventually, if it gets to a point where it's too big, then decryption is going to fail. So this should be avoided. Um, so this is what's going to limit our maximal depth. So just to see what the noise looks like for a fresh ciphertext in FB as an example. Um, so we're using this invariant noise definition. And yeah, so what's going on here? So um, if we were decrypting a freshly encrypted ciphertext, we would be doing um, this operation. So we do T over Q times C0 plus C1S. So this is C0 C1. So then that's what I've written here. And then you can see that there's... Um, some term that's going to eventually be m plus some term introduced by this rounding down, and then some just other stuff. And then there's also some parts cancel out, which are the parts that could be large. So you're ending up with something that should be formed of small elements because the secret and error distributions are small. This guy is like less than t at most. So this whole thing should be small. So when you, um, you firstly do this evaluation step, I guess, um, it's like evaluating the ciphertext at the secret key, and then you need to round and take mod t. Well, if you're going to round and hope to get m out mod t, which is what you would want for correctness, you need that all of this uh, term goes away in the rounding. So this is the noise term, and then we need that the noise is less than one half, otherwise it won't, in, in norm, otherwise it won't go to zero. So this is exactly like capturing why the noise being too large would cause decryption to fail. Okay. So what, what terms in there grow through uh, as you evaluate? Yeah, so this is just in a fresh ciphertext. And then, like, if you, for example, added two ciphertexts, um, then if you imagined, so the addition is component wise. Oh. So then you would imagine, like, evaluating the decryption of that. So if you um, had, like, C0 plus D1 and that comma um, D0 plus D1 then if you did that thing plus s times this thing, it comes out as like C0 plus C1s plus D0 plus D1s, which comes out like um, message plus noise, message one plus noise one plus message two plus noise one, then message one plus message two is your message term, because obviously it, you want it to encrypt M1 plus M2 if it's addition, and then so your noise is, is just V1 plus V2 in that case. And then multiplication is a more complicated thing with some cross terms as well. But yeah, that's how the noise would grow. OK, so yeah, so you get um, constraints on the noise, uh, gives you kind of a decryption bound for FB. And then possibility of decoding failure gives you a decoding constraint. And then in the high precision FB, because the decryption and decoding is somehow folded into one, I guess I didn't say that explicitly on the slide, I'm sorry about that. You get this like overall constraint. And then you just like um, see what's the maximal depth you can achieve subject to these constraints. So here's the results. I don't know if this is big enough to make any sense of. So um, we're looking, each picture is a different kind of setting for A and L, um, the other parameters of the, the regular circuit. So here we've got no additions, three additions, 10 additions, and then the different lines is different Ls. Uh, dotted line is, oh, I can't even see, I'm so sorry. <laughs> dotted line is HPFV, and solid line is regular FV. Yes, that's what we want. So, because um, then you see that the, the HPFV is, is, is much better. So, yeah, some things to take away from this slide. Yeah, number one, obviously, the depth you can achieve in HPFB is more. Number two is, like, if you have a lot of additions, then FV seems like to be performing worse, because here it could get up to maybe depth five, but here it definitely isn't getting up to depth five. Additions are hurting it. Whereas, like, here we're getting up to, like, 16, and here we're getting up to, like, 15, so it's still pretty good. Um, yeah, so... The, the conclusion is HBFV outperforms FV for these kind of circuits. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, here are the two papers that the talk was based on. Um, please feel free to get in touch. <laughs>